Good evening. My name is Jonathan Overpeck, and I'm the Samuel A. Graham Dean of the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, yeah, I'm a real live climate scientist, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing what we're going to be discussing. My thanks to all of you for being with us. Uh, while I wish you could be here in person, like a normal Weggy lecture, uh, I think it's very exciting that we could all be together for the first remote Weggy lecture, virtual lecture. Uh, the Peter M. Weggy lecture series is named in honor of the late Peter M. Weggy for his countless contributions to our university and especially to our Center for Sustainable Systems, a very important part of our School for Environment and Sustainability and the driving force behind this event tonight. My heartfelt thanks to Peter Weggy, his family and the Weggy Foundation for making this event possible. Let's take a moment now to remember Peter with a brief video. The steel case started green in 1970, actually. We didn't know what green meant at that time, but oh, we tried to improve all of all, everything we could uh, in the process of making furniture to, to make it safe. We had local people, we had students, and we had professors, and we had the University of Michigan and other people like that working on projects that we were trying to solve. One was air, water, uh, clean air, clean water, and uh, the proper disposal of waste. That's how we started. And uh, so people were not doing that in those days. And we didn't have the EPA at that time to really uh, say you, you can't do that anymore. You're creating all the bad stuff that has to be cleaned up. Why not do it right in the first place? So that's where we started in 1970. Do all the good you can for all the people you can for as long as you can. Just if you did that in your life, just think of what would happen. Thanks again to the Weggy family and foundation. I'd also like to thank the Porter Family Foundation, whose support was instrumental in making tonight's event a reality. And thanks for the, pro the promotional partners in the community, including the Ecology Center and A20, and also our partners across the university campus. We appreciate your support. A few quick housekeeping items. This conversation is being recorded and will be posted on the C's website in the days following this event. A UM students have been asking questions and they're gonna be in part of this program. And they have some great topics to explore. Thank you in advance to all of the students who are involved. To kick us off, Naomi has asked us to share this video that she worked to create with Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Please join me in imagining this message from the future. Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet 
and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the Federal Jobs Guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. 
Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stop being so scared of the future. We stop being scared of each other. And we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too. And in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. What an incredible video. This video excites me and makes me excited about the future. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are calling in from the world. My name is Dominic Bednar, and I am a PhD candidate at the School for Environment and Sustainability, um, studying energy justice. My research explores energy poverty, recognition, and response in the United States. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's Wiggy Lecture speaker. Naomi Klein is an award-winning journalist, columnist, and author of New York Times and international bestsellers, No Logo, The Shock Doctrine, This Changes Everything, No Is Not Enough, and On Fire, which have been translated into over 30 languages. Her recently released book, How to Change Everything, The Young Human's Guide to Protecting the Planet and Each Other, uplifts and engages the stories of youth climate leaders and the transformative moment that they're powering. Naomi is a senior correspondent for The Intercept, Puffin Writing Fellow at Type Media Center, and contributor to the, for The Nation and The Guardian. Klein is the inaugural Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University. She is the co-founder of the climate justice organization, The Leap, and the recipient of the Sydney Peace Prize for her activism on climate justice. Her writing offers piercing critiques on capitalism and the climate crisis, whilst imbuing hope that we can make a difference. Always with a global perspective, Klein's work challenges and encourages us to think and to act radically differently. I'm inspired by her deep commitment as a researcher, author, and activist, and honored to welcome, albeit virtually, to the University of Michigan. Naomi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dominic, for that lovely introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with you. I wanna thank Dean Overpeck and everybody at SEAS who is welcoming me here. Um, and I also wanna thank uh, the Weggy Foundation um, for making my visit possible. And I had hoped to be there in person. Uh, one of the many things that was canceled when everything hashtag was canceled. Um, but I am really pleased to be able to be with you anyway and to be speaking to you from unceded Coast Salish territory in what is now called British Columbia, the lands of the Seashelt Nation, um, and um, very grateful for their stewardship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that land acknowledgement. Um, I'll kick us off with the first question. Uh, the new administration has endorsed a $2 trillion climate plan and has appointed an impressive and diverse climate change team, including New Mexico representative Deb Holland to run the Interior Department. The US has also joined, rejoined the Paris Climate Accord. 
What are your hopes for what can be accomplished in this new political climate? Um, you know, my hopes were just shown in that video. <laughs> um, and uh, and it's, it, you know, it's interesting watching it because we put it out two years ago um, and we're kind of on track. <laughs> took back the house and the Senate. Um, and, you know, I, I had been, I worked for a different candidate in the primaries, but what's really remarkable is the extent to which the framing of the climate justice movement um, has shaped the agenda of this incoming administration. And it really is um, a testament to the power of that organizing and to the power of those other primary uh, uh, campaigns um, and the Sanders-Biden uh, committees, one shared by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Varshney Prakash from Sunrise was on it. Um, and, and so much of the framing, I think what we feared from Biden was that it would be a return to the Obama years in a kind of a very narrow approach to the climate policy. Like this is something for the EPA to deal with, you know, and the energy department, and that's kind of it. And this whole discourse of, no, we need to thread it through everything we do. We need to have climate czars that are making sure everybody's talking to each other. Um, we need to, to have a sense of emergency. Justice needs to be at the center of it. Um, the fact that the that, that not only is there, there this huge uh, um, uh, green infrastructure plan, but that 40% of it is going to be going to frontline communities. At least that's the commitment. Um, this is this is not, sorry, it's not because Biden's a great guy. <laughs> this is the same Biden <laughs> that was there for eight years under Obama, and we didn't get this. This is because you get what you organize for. And what we're seeing is that if we keep organizing, if we keep pushing, uh, you mentioned uh, Deb Holland. I mean, I think that appointment has to do with a lot of great organizing as well. I mean, this was one of the big demands from the environmental justice community and particularly indigenous communities. So I'm not sanguine, you know, I'm, I'm always panicked. <laughs> I'm always panicked. I'm always hearing the climate uh, clock ticking in the background um, and always feeling that sense of what we've lost because we wasted those years, you know? So I'm mad too, but I, but I also, yes. I, I, I feel like we're in a better position than we've ever been politically. Um, and I'm excited to see what comes next. Thank you for, for that. And I, I love how you, you know, couch it in how, how important framing is um, really to move things forward and to, to get things done. Um, and so I have a follow-up question. Um, thinking about framing, um, what do you think makes the Green New Deal such a compelling way to address the climate crisis? And what do you view as the biggest challenge to getting a Green New Deal and how do we overcome them? Um, so I think it is a, a compelling frame because it foregrounds jobs. Um, it foregrounds the need for a fairer economy. Um, it carries with it warnings. I think by invoking the original New Deal, um, we, we are reminded that the United States has done big things in the past, but we're also reminded of who was excluded. Um, and, you know, um, African Americans were excluded, migrant communities were excluded, women were excluded. Um, and so, you know, the, the vision that, that we laid out, for instance, it's, it was very deliberate in, 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 you know, in the video, for instance, foregrounding care work, right? Domestic workers were excluded from the original New Deal. We want an expansive definition of what a green job is. You know, some of you may have heard me say this before, but a green job is not just a guy in a hard hat putting up a solar panel, though it is that, <laughs> but it is also, uh, you know, it is also a, 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 an immigrant woman taking care of a child, um, being paid a living wage in her union job, having her work respected um, and, and, and valued as part of a low carbon economy, right? Um, so I think that what, we need to be expansive in what we consider to be a climate policy. Because if we look at the original New Deal, and this is why I think it is useful to have that frame, it also reminds us of how hard people fought to win it, right? This is why I like the New Deal better than the kind of World War II mobilization framing, because many of those World War II policies were very top down, whereas 
the New Deal was demanded by workers from below um, and was produced by, through an era of, of mass workplace disruption, general strikes, closing down ports, I mean, huge workplace mobilizations. And one of the things I always find striking is that if you look at the 1930s, what you see is that as the New Deal was being rolled out, there were more and more mobilizations by workers, more and more strikes. So people weren't complacent. They didn't say, thank you very much. You know, now we'll just relax. It was like, no, we want more. Um, and so for right now, there's a there, there's a piece of legislation that's just passed the House, it's going to be going to the Senate called the PRO Act, which is going to make it easier for workers to form a union. We should see that as a climate policy, um, because when workers are empowered, that's when we win big things. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think that that's, that's frankly one of the biggest challenges we have is how successfully unions have been targeted over the past 30 years and that workers, um, you know, fear organizing because they don't have enough labor protection. So I would say passing the PRO Act is a climate policy. Um, let's make it easier for workers to organize their workplaces. Um, another uh, piece of legislation I'm excited about is uh, Jamal Bowman has introduced something. Well, it's not a, it's a resolution called the Care, Care for All Act. Um, and it is, um, uh, you know, a plan to, to, to really uh, respect the work of care at every level and recognizing it as, as climate work, uh, among other things, essential to our economy. Yeah, I could go on. I'm also really <laughs> excited about the possibilities of a civilian climate corps. Um, this is something that uh, that 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 Biden uh, is is promising to introduce. I think it holds tremendous potential if it is rolled out well, uh, particularly for, for 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 young people. I mean, the original CCC was a was a plan to create jobs for young people um, in the Great Depression, and you know, I I. I think young people right now are are experiencing this economic crisis, um, you know, are really on the front lines, right? And so many of the service jobs that put young people through university have been eliminated. Um, and I think young people have been so isolated from each other, from their communities. So the idea of programs that puts young people in community with one another, on the land, um, you know, really solving the crisis is is really something I'm particularly excited about because it has that solving a bunch of problems at, at once. The need for jobs, a mental health crisis, an iso social isolation crisis, and of course the ecological crisis. Thank you Thank for, you that. for that. I love I the love emphasis that. on just more, a more, more expansive approach, approach, but, but also, also integrated and interwoven. Um, so, so thank you. We're hoping to see some movement towards adopting a Green New Deal. Um, our next question comes from a master's student, Ikra Nasser. Thanks, Dominic. Hi, Naomi. My name is Ikra Nasser. I'm a current third year dual degree master's student at SEAS and also at the Ford School of Public Policy. I'm also a first generation student who's interested in implementing practical policies to ensure safe, clean, and accessible drinking water for future generations. The environmental movement is overwhelmingly white. Do you think this is, a hin this is hindering progress in addressing climate change? How can white activists create a more inclusive movement that actively includes diverse voices that will allow for more effective climate strategies? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ikra. That's a great question. And, um, I guess the short answer is that I, I, I absolutely agree that it is hindering progress. Um, and the reason for that is pretty straightforward. I think when people are fighting for the basics of life, for their survival, they, f they fight differently. Um, and I've seen this, you know, again and again, I, you know, think about Standing Rock. Think about the incredible mobilization, Water is Life, um, a community that came together to protect their sole source of drinking water uh, from a pipeline that had been rooted originally through a majority white city, Bismarck, and had been rerouted when that city rejected it in a clear example, a flagrant example of environmental racism um, of the kind that folks are very familiar with in Michigan. Um, 
and, and obviously in Flint, in, in Detroit. Um, and, and that community came together led by young people. One of the things that, that a lot of people don't know is that it was like 13 and 14 year olds who, 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 who first mobilized against the Dakota Access Pipeline and felt that it was possible um, to win. You know, I, I was in Standing Rock when the Obama administration finally uh, um, denied the permit to, for the pipeline to go to go under the river. And and I was with a young climate activist named Takata Iron Eyes and, and and I had my phone and I asked her on camera how she felt in that moment. And she just burst into tears and said, I feel like I have my future back. And so what I would say is when people feel like they are truly fighting for their future, um, the, the quality of the fight, the tenacity of the fight is just completely different. Um, and the fact is the climate crisis is an incredibly unjust crisis. It, it, it is the, the, the overwhelming uh, majority of greenhouse gas emissions were emitted by the richest 20% of people on the planet, 70% of global emissions. Um, and yet wealth buys protection. This is the harsh truth. So it is. So there's the geography of it, just in terms of climate vulnerability. If you're in a hotter climate, you're more vulnerable. But it's also that the more money you have, the more you have a kinds of backup plans, right? What does that look like? It looks like Ted Cruz and his wife texting their friends going, you wanna get out of here? I mean, it's cold, we don't have power. Let's go to the Ritz Carlton in Cancun. And that is just like an, an expression of, of, of what it means to sort of think that your money protects you from the worst impact. So people who don't have those safety nets, right? Um, fight differently, right? Um, and so, you know, I think for too long in the environmental movement, there's been this sense of like, oh, it's politically correct to diversify our staff or whatever. It's not about that. It's actually about winning. It's actually about about about, about organizing to win. And so I see that changing um, because of, of battles like Standing Rock and because of uh, just dogged organizing of the EJ community and the Climate Justice uh, Alliance in particular has really been pushing funders so I guess I would just say, yes, I think big green groups need to diversify. But I also think that funding for, 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 for environmental organizing needs to move to the, to, to the frontline groups that are already organizing um, and, 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 and so that they're able to have the resources that they need to lead. Um, because they are already leading in so many ways, but there's just these huge inequities in who is getting funding. Um, and I also think that we need to think beyond beyond the nation state when we think about these issues, right? Um, the, the impacts, the unfair and unjust impacts of the climate crisis uh, play out globally. And so are we showing, uh, you know, we, it's not just about changing the faces, it's about changing the principles, right? That the most impacted need to lead and that's within our countries. And it's globally as well. And so when you have something like this historic mobilization of small farmers in India, um, the, you know, by, some, by some estimates, the largest uh, uh, protest in India's history, hundreds of thousands of farmers in the streets. And it is intimately linked to the climate crisis because this is a mobilization that was sparked by farming laws that make farmers' life more precarious, and they're already so precarious because of the climate crisis, among other issues, the global climate movement should be standing up and saying, "This is a, we stand with you. And it's been actually young climate activists in the student Fridays for Futures movement who have stood up and stood with the farmers and really put like the big green groups to shame, frankly. Um, and so, yeah. But I, we need to do way more. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Your point about making sure we raise folks platforms who are on the front line of this issue, but also making sure, you know, everyone understands their role in a part of a global crisis that we're undergoing. So thank you so much, Naomi. Next, you'll have a question from student Akash. Hi, Naomi. I'm Akash, and I'm a student here at the School for Environment and Sustainability. Um, I'm originally from India, and I choose to pursue an MS degree since 
I wanted to help developing nations transition to a clean energy future, while at the same time uh, helping move their millions of people out of poverty. Um, so my question for you today is, um, so with the US having a renewed focus and leadership on climate action, how would this lead to um, great, greater global efforts, especially after some countries choose to hide behind the US inaction for the past four years? And also, how can the US contribute to the already existing global efforts? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Akash. Um, another great question. I shouldn't be surprised from this group, but um, yeah, so, I mean, one critique I would have of the discourse in the United States around the Green New Deal so far is that I think it has been too nationalist. Um, and the truth is that these ideas around climate justice um, come from the global south. And, you know, when I wrote this Changes Everything that came out uh, whew, seven years ago now, believe it or not, um, you know, I began that 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 book with a quote from uh, a woman named Angelica Navarro, who at the time was a climate negotiator for Evo Morales' government in Bolivia. And she had just made this sort of spectacular speech at the United Nations in 2009, calling for a Marshall Plan for Planet Earth um, and a redistribution of resources from the global north to the global south so that global south countries could leapfrog over fossil fuels and go directly to renewable energy. Um, and the calls for that kind of a framework, climate debt, a climate debt framework that recognize that um, you know, huge parts of the global south have been pillaged in order to and destroyed in order to extract fossil fuels that have been burned in the north, like the Niger Delta, you know, or the Ecuadorian Amazon, site of the largest uh, oil spill on land in uh, in in in, our, in global history. Um, the these, th that's where the concept of ecological debt came from, from movements like Acción Ecológica in, in, in Ecuador. Um, and, and so it has finally come to, you know, the, the wealthiest country in the world, the United States, in the form of the Green New Deal. But it's often discussed without, first of all, acknowledging the roots of the concept um, and, 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 and kind of imagining that climate justice stops at the border. So that really has to change. Um, and we know how it has to change because we have a UN, you know, treaty uh, uh, on, on climate change that recognizes our quote unquote common but differentiated responsibility. And what that is, is, and the US signed that treaty, um, that, it, that that is an acknowledgement that the countries that have been emitting carbon on an industrial scale for a couple of hundred years have to do more faster and also have to help with climate financing. Um, and so, you know, one of the reasons why I was a volunteer for the Sanders campaign and was a surrogate for Bernie was because Bernie was the only candidate who was talking about climate financing. And he was talking about committing $200 billion um, in for, 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 for climate financing. Um, and we have a lot of work to do, you know, in, in pushing the Biden administration to have a much more internationalist approach. Um, and, so you're absolutely right in that the Trump years provided this protection for other governments um, because everybody looked good in comparison to Trump, right? So, to, you know, so Justin Trudeau in Canada, where I am now, um, was, you know, able to position himself as a climate leader, even as he bought oil pipelines to push them through uh, unceded indigenous lands. So it's already ch shifting, frankly, where just because the, the Biden administration is moving very quickly and doing things like canceling the Keystone XL pipeline, it's now harder for, um, you know, uh, politicians like Trudeau and Macron to kind of greenwash. But I think, you know, another element of it is the way in which, you know, somebody like a Bolsonaro or other leaders in the global South who don't want to act on climate are able to say, well, the U.S. isn't acting. Why should we? Right. And to kind of adopt a kind of uh, a nationalist, anti-imperialist discourse as a shield for their climate inaction. Um, so the best thing the U.S. can do is just push, 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 do more. And, and the more the U.S. does, both in terms of lowering its own emissions and paying its fair shares into a climate financing fund, um, the less it is possible for 
those leaders to use the U.S. inaction um, as an excuse for their own. And it just allows the movements in those countries to push as they're already pushing. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, it was pretty insightful. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to another student, Jack Tiener. Thank you. Hi, Naomi. My name is Jack Tiener, and I am a first year master's student studying environment and sustainability, as well as energy systems engineering. And I'm excited about using my education to work towards a just energy transition that leverages change to improve the livelihoods of people from all backgrounds. So the climate activists of our generation have rightly focused on necessary carbon reduction goals, environmental health and safety concerns, science-based decision-making in government, and an increasing focus on climate justice. So looking towards the future, if we are able to step back from the brink of climate disaster by accomplishing these things, or at the minimum, maintaining a livable planet for generations to come, which is admittedly a big assumption to make, what do you think the role and demands of climate activists of the future will be? So in other words, what will be the most pressing climate and environment issues of the future? Um, well, thank you, Jack. Um, that is a bit of an optimistic question. <laughs> um, and I think I disagree with the premise in that I think that the work that you're describing in terms of decarbonization is going to be the work of all of our lives. Um, you know, this is this is not going to be something that we um, we don't we won't achieve the transformations in a decade. We need to have done a huge amount in, a, in the next decade, but there's still going to be a lot of work to do. Um, so but but what I would say um, is that even as we continue to do that work, I think that we are going to have to figure out how to live more densely um, on on less land. Um, because the fact is that we have locked in enough warming that 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 more and more people are going to have to move inside countries like the United States um, and between countries. And so I think that it is, is going to honestly require reimagining of borders, the rights of migrants, the rights of people to move. And inside our countries, we have to have uh, we have to really rethink housing in particular because um, you know we're already seeing a huge amount of displacement. And so I'll just give you an example, like uh, an area where I've done some research, Paradise, California, which as we know, burned to the ground a couple of years ago in, in the deadliest wildfire in California's history. So um, about 20,000 people from Paradise ended up in Chico, California, which, you know, without much traffic is 10 minutes away. Um, so suddenly you had the, uh, a, a pretty small city in Northern California. Uh, I think that I think they only had about 100,000 people living in Chico and suddenly they had another 20,000. Now Chico already didn't have enough affordable housing, right? So what happens when you suddenly have 20,000 new neighbors? Um, and what happened is that first people were incredible, mutual aid, all the incredible, you know, opening up their homes, spare bedrooms, doing everything they could. But then rent started going up. Um, people started getting evicted uh, because their landlords wanted to flip the house. Suddenly, Chico was the hottest real estate market in um, in 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 the entire country, which is you know makes no sense. Uh, it's like a scrappy little you know community, um, and. And, and there were all of these stresses and a, a homelessness population exploded. Uh, at, and at first there was the idea, okay, well, we should be creating shelters. Then there was a backlash against the shelters. Um, then, then there was just a police response and people started to be evicted from their tents, from parks. So my takeaway from this is, first of all, housing is a climate issue. Affordable housing is a climate issue. And if we don't want to turn on each other, if we want people to act on their best selves, and we saw a lot of that in Chico at the beginning, then we need policies that um, that really support people. We can't have profiteering in the midst of disasters. It is so toxic when you're seeing people profiting from this disaster that's immiserating your own life. Um, so yeah, I, I think that these are this is these are going to be frontline climate issues as more and more people are forced to move. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that thoughtful response and for just taking the time to answer some student questions. So I'll now turn it back over to Dean Overpack for some additional questions. Thanks, Jack. And thanks, Naomi. Uh, this is uh, a real pleasure to hear your views on this amazing topic of climate crisis and hopefully a transition to a more sustainable and just world. Um, I want to dig a little deeper into some of the things you've written about. You're a, a famous author and you've you've really written some compelling work. Um, and one of the things is to talk about the concept of climate barbarism and eco-fascism. I'm hoping you can uh, tell those in the audience who don't aren't familiar with these concepts what they are quickly and, and what we can do to fight them. Sure. Um, so I, I guess I think that the best way to understand eco-fascism is it's what comes after denial on the hard right. So within a worldview that is already sort of comfortable ranking the relative value of human life and sort of blaming the poor for being poor and thinking that people who are wealthy are wealthy because they're somehow better and, and, and harder working. Um, so you have this, you know, what social scientists call a hierarchical worldview. Um, if you, if, if within that worldview, once you can no longer deny the reality of climate change, and we're kind of getting to that point, we're seeing climate change denial levels drop even among Republicans, particularly younger Republicans. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to suddenly see the light and be like, okay, great, let's sign on to the Paris Accord and lower emissions and you know, pay our climate debt and open the borders to climate refugees who didn't create this crisis. Um, what actually is more likely to happen, and we can see this in places like Australia and Europe where there are lower levels of climate change denial, but a very strong um, and, and, and rising fascist right, is um, climate becomes weaponized as part of a, of, a, of a fascist discourse where it's like we have um, we are in an era of disruption that means we have to fortress our borders um, and, uh, and 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 look after our own and deploy racist arguments to justify that um, because you need a racist argument to justify allowing people to drown in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, when they're displaced through no fault of their own. Um, so, you know, we're, we've seen some examples of this in the United States. Um, the, the mass shooting in an El Paso Walmart, um, uh, about a, I think it was about a year and a half ago now, um, that, uh, that, the, that, uh, um, massacre was committed by someone who identified himself as an eco-fascist. And he said that he chose that Walmart. Um, sorry, I'm going to adjust the lighting in a second. He said that he chose that Walmart um, because it was frequented by a lot of Mexicans crossing the border. And he had said, he said explicitly in his manifesto that if Mexicans started consuming the way Americans consumed, then it would be environmentally unsustainable. Um, the mass shooter in New Zealand, in Christchurch, New Zealand, who killed, um, I think, more than 50 people in two mosques in, tw in, in uh, uh, 2019, also, he identified himself as an ethno, uh, ethno-nationalist eco-fascist, and he blamed immigrants for despoiling the environment. Marine Le Pen's... Um, you know, neo-fascist party in France, which used to be called the Front National, they've rebranded. Um, they're not climate change deniers. They use climate change as one of their reasons for their racist policy. So how do we you know, fight it? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I believe that the kinds of policies that the Green New Deal represents that create good jobs that address economic precarity, take some of the fuel out of rising fascism. I don't think they defeat it. Um, and I, I think that it can only really be defeated frontally. And I'm not sure it is ever completely defeated, but I think we can take some fuel out of it um, by, by 
rolling out climate policies that actually help people's day-to-day lives. I'm just going to adjust the light because I'm getting blinded here. Is that? I believe that is sunlight. Yes, there we go. Yes, we don't have sunlight out here now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just... I'm in. I'm in uh... I'm in another time zone. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, well, it's um, let's go one step deeper into that. Um, you know, there's social uh, media is just rife with all sorts of conspiracy theories and denial and all sorts of wacky stuff. And um, we're in a, we're in universities. Uh, you spend a lot of your time in, at Rutgers. Uh, what can universities do? Uh, to be more proactive and successful in helping to sort of make our decision-making more science-based and in doing so, hopefully speed this transition to a more sustainable and just world. Hmm. Have you given any thoughts to that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've given a lot of thought to how we can address our, the polluted state of our information ecology. Um, and I think, you know, this is a conversation that needs to involve communication scholars and, and um, there's a lot of great scholarship happening that I think is, is, it needs to be more in conversation with the, the climate movement. And I think, you know, as a climate scientist, that climate scientists were in a way the canary in the coal mine for a lot of the conspiracy theories and, and, and cyber bullying with hacked emails and, um, and, and the, a lot of what has now been is, is normalized um, uh, in our public discourse. Climate scientists were some of the first people to, to be attacked um, in that way. Um, but I think that we, I think there's something fundamentally flawed with our entire, the, the business model that is governing how we're getting our information. Um, we, these are not information companies, they're essentially surveillance companies. Their business model is to extract data from users. Um, and the way to get the most data is to keep people engaged. And the way to keep people engaged is to keep them angry. Um, and people engage more on Facebook and on Twitter when they're angry um, than when they're having like a thoughtful, calm discussion. Uh, and so we have a conflict between the business model of the primary purveyors of information now um, and the kinds of discussion that we need. Um, and so, you know, Shoshana Zuboff has called this business model surveillance capitalism. And uh, I, I don't think it's compatible really with thoughtful, deliberative discussion. Um, I don't think it's an acceptable business model just to, to, to mine the data of your users and sell it to third parties so that they can better you know, track you online and predict your behavior. Um, and it's having a terrible impact on journalism, right? I mean, we've just seen just yesterday a whole new wave of layoffs uh, at, 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 at Huffington Post. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I think universities absolutely have a role to play, but I think we need to really, I think our information ecology is in crisis. I think uh, people are getting their news. We're seeing it around COVID from Facebook groups, not their local newspapers, because their local newspapers don't exist in lots of cases, or they're very, very thin, and they're not really doing journalism anymore. Um, and a lot of this is because the ad dollars have just gone straight up, straight to Google and Facebook. Um, and and uh, yeah, so I think what universities can do is create spaces for real world community conversations. Um, and I think that there's now that we are in a situation where we're going to be uh, hopefully rolling out climate policies as opposed to just talking about it, um, the more that we can have participation, engagement at the community level um, where people feel like they have a stake, they've been listened to, they, they, they're, they're having a role in the kinds of policies that, that are being rolled out, the more support that there will be. Um, and so... I think universities can play a really important sort of convening role in the communities where we are. 
Um, and I think we should do more of that kind of community-based engagement. Yeah, I kind of side on on that approach. It's, uh, you know, we can yell and talk to each other all day long, but like you're describing with uh, surveillance capitalism and some of these other uh, phenomenon, uh, we might not have the upper hand in being able to just communicate our way out of it. I think we have to engage, we have to build more trust. And I can't help but think that universities, we're all over the place. We're trusted in our local communities. What if we got more engaged and helped our communities uh, see the, the positives of making this transition? Um, I wonder if there are any lessons in COVID. Uh, you know, certainly we're seeing in COVID a lot of evidence, new evidence of uh, inequity, both in the U.S. and around the world. Do you see any shifts in how people are perceiving these environmental and scientific issues in a, in a better light? Or is it really going to come back to we got to engage more in, in communities? Because that's not really, we're missing that in COVID as well. Yeah, I mean, I think just going back to what you were saying about we can't communicate your way out of it. I mean, I absolutely agree with that. I think I think at this point, you can have all the great messaging you want, but ultimately we need to start rolling out policies that change people's lives and that and, and, and change their minds through that. Um, I often talk about the way FDR rolled out the original New Deal. He cited projects in rural communities that had voted against him. Um, yeah. And many of those communities flipped uh, in, in 1936 when he ran for re-election um, because, be, not because they had been having abstract debates about whether the New Deal was socialist or not, which of course the right was say it was, but because there was a program in their community that created jobs and improved people's lives and they could see it for themselves. And so I think that's the that's the, that, that's where that's what we should be doing from a climate perspective, just rolling out the policies less talk, more more actual programs. And it's also what we should be doing from a communications and polarization point of view as well. Just kind of doing an end run around Fox and just kind of letting people see it in their own lives. Um, in terms of COVID, I mean, one thing I would say is that um, in the places that I think have done best are places that have depoliticized it. Um, and and handed the microphone over to health experts. So I'm speaking to you from British Columbia, Canada at the moment, where my family lives. I'm Zoom teaching to back to Rutgers. And it's so striking, you know, coming here from New Jersey, where, you know, we were getting like the Cuomo press conferences every day and every it was so political. Um, and then coming to Canada and to a part of Canada with very low COVID rates, we barely hear, hear from politicians about COVID. And we hear the briefings directly from a woman named Dr. Bonnie Henry, um, who's become a bit of a folk hero. Um, and she just very calmly tells people what they need to do and what they're doing wrong. Um, and, 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 and people trust her, but they also trust her because there are more social supports that allow people to stay home, right? I mean, I think that this is a big, big lesson. It isn't just about like the top down stay at home order, lockdown order. It's also, here's, we're gonna give you what you need to stay home. We're gonna cover 80% of your salary um, indefinitely. We're gonna protect you from evictions. We are gonna make sure that quarantine, it's possible in the cases where quarantine is necessary. Um, I think there's a lot to learn from that uh, when it comes to climate, both about communications and also I think we now know what it looks like for governments to treat an emergency like an emergency. Um, you know, those of us who were born after the Second World War, we've had no lived experience of what it actually means to see a society on emergency footing. Um, and now we do. Now we've seen it. We've caught glimpses of it. Um, and we certainly know that that's not what we're seeing when it comes to, uh, to the climate crisis. So, you know, Greta Thunberg and other young climate leaders have been calling on leaders now, treat the climate as an emergency. And I think before COVID, that seemed like a bit of an abstraction. And so you had all these governments passing climate emergency declarations and then continuing on with business as usual. Whereas now, I think we have something to measure it against, where it's like, okay, well, what you know, we know what we know what emergency footing looks like looks like, and it isn't what we're seeing yet. We're not yet seeing emergency footing. 
That's good, you know, and I and I do feel like a lot of my student colleagues here at the University of Michigan and NCs have really stepped up in recognition that it's an emergency, and they're helping us uh, slightly older folks to understand that we can't just sit around waiting for government to solve the problem. Uh, fortunately, we do have a government, as you've pointed out tonight, that is going to make it a priority and is going to put a lot of resources into it. We hope, um, but you've also pointed out maybe we have to get in the, in the, in the dirt too, and help push this along and make it happen, particularly in our communities where we have the better relationships. I, one thing I've noticed with COVID, but also with, and you've probably seen this too, you know, we have a lot of youth heroes, but at the same time, we have a lot of youth um, who are kind of depressed about the situation, you know, this world that we have created and these problems we have created I know you and I haven't, I hope, done our fair share of that. But, you know, to some extent, we've all contributed to this, this, these world's uh, problems that these future generations are inheriting. And, you know, from a Rutgers uh, professor to a University of Michigan professor, what can we do to sort of give the students more hope? What can they do? to get more hope. And you've touched on this a little already, but what's the one thing you'd want to leave them with? We're out of time. What's the one thing you want to leave them with? Because this is their future. We have to help them, but they, you know, we have to, we're all in this together. We are all in this together. And, and I think that the best way for young people to give young people hope, honestly, is for all of us to act on this emergency. Um, and not kind of offload it onto them and say, well, it's your future, right? It, um, you know, I think we, we need to be mobilizing our elders. Um, and and, and, and we, we, we need to have young people's backs. And the one thing I would just say to young people about despair <laughs> is, you know, this is a really hard, this is a hard topic in the best of times to be talking about the uh, crisis in our one and only home and the living systems on which we all depend. Um, it, it, it's, it's particularly difficult to talk about in a, a world where we are spending so much time in isolation, so much time looking at, at screens and feeling alone. And so I think the the main thing I would say is um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> um, people are getting vaccinated. Spring is coming. We're going to be able to meet more outdoors. We are not. We are in an extraordinary moment where there are so many people, more than at any point by far in my life, and I think yours as well, where people really get that this is an emergency and there truly is a movement. We have not been able to be in movement in, in you know in community with each other because of COVID. But I would say as soon as you possibly can. Get yourselves into community with other people. Do it outdoors because it's safer and remind yourselves that you're not alone in this. Um, because it, I think it's when we feel that we are carrying this on our own, on our own shoulders, um, and feel like this dissonance between just our small selves and the magnitude and scale of this crisis that we feel so overwhelmed. So it's time for us to get back together again. It will be safe to do so soon. Um, in the meantime, we just have to remember that we have seen things shift so quickly. Um, and the, the even in the, the bleakness of the Trump years, this is when the Green New Deal was put on the agenda. This is when a new generation of leaders like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the rest of the squad and Greta Thunberg and the student strike movement emerged and found their voice and found their moral clarity. Um, and not to just hold the line of where we were before Trump, but to move it so far forward that now that we have this new administration, they are doing things that w would have been unimaginable during the Obama years. So um, it's a lot, but this is the, you, you know, that you have prepared yourself for this moment with the education that you have gotten. You have exactly the skills that this moment calls for. And, and what this moment calls for is getting specific working with communities to actually say, okay, what are the policies? What do they look like? And, and showing people that it's possible and using your skills, your education, your passion um, to help people believe in, in that future that we caught a little glimpse of with that film. 
Uh, so I want to thank you for that. And I know that it is difficult. And I know that, that, that you know, we all struggle with feelings of despair. Um, and, you know, when, when it feels too heavy to carry on your own, just make sure to, to find some people to, to help you carry it because they're out there. You're not alone. Thanks. That's a great message to wrap up on. Um, it's been wonderful to meet you remotely, Naomi Klein. I hope I meet you in person someday. I hope you get a chance to meet a lot of the folks who are watching you this evening. Um, you've written some great books, and I hope everyone digs into them uh, in your videos and learns more from you. I think that's a great message. Uh, I think we all have to be relentless uh, and work together to create this uh, better world, this world without climate change, this world that's more sustainable. And most importantly, a world that's just, where everyone benefits and shares burdens equally. Um, everybody else on this, uh, sharing this discussion tonight, I wanna thank you too. You can of course go to our website and get the recording of this discussion this evening, and also get a sense of uh, other events that you might wish to take part in both at SEAS and other uh, schools and colleges at the University of Michigan. This is a priority for all of the University of Michigan, for all of Ann Arbor, for all of Washtenaw County, and for all of Michigan. And you're gonna see a lot of action in just trying to create this world that Naomi Klein's been talking about. And hopefully you can all get involved and hopefully you will get involved in making this a better, uh, more sustainable and just world. And with that, I just wanna say thanks, stay safe. Uh, and go blue. Good night. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much.